So kia ora koutou and thank you Laura um, for the opportunity to discuss this important issue. Um, like you said, my name is Natasha and I'm an emergency registrar and I'm currently working in Middlemore Hospital and I'm also a mother to three young children and I enjoy doing research in my spare time. Um, so today I'm just going to present to you some of the research that my colleagues and I published last year in the New Zealand Medical Journal on the incidence and risk factors of dog bites requiring hospitalisation in New Zealand. And I just want to cover some of the background as to what motivated us to undertake this research, what our results were, uh, what some of the other studies have shown about the circumstances surrounding a dog attack, and just propose some ideas for prevention from a public health perspective. So this research was initiated by uh, Mr. Zachary Moavini, who's a plastic surgeon at Middlemore Hospital, after he was involved with the surgical repair of over 100 dog bites on a seven-year-old girl who was attacked by two dogs within their own home five years ago. Uh, this was a tragic event, and along with the ongoing large number of dog bites that he sees on a regular basis, this motivated him to highlight serious dog bites as a public health issue in the hope that further prevention strategies can be undertaken. My own motivation came after my two-year-old son initially was attacked by a dog on a beach, and I've also had um, uh, dogs attack my children at a school. Uh, so I joined Zachary and uh, Dr. Jonathan Meir in getting this research published. Um, however, I would also like to highlight that we're not against dogs. Our aim is to prevent dog bites. Um, the research that we published last year only focused on the more severe dog bites that are admitted into hospital for further treatment, such as having IV antibiotics or requiring surgery. And this was during the years 2004 to 2014. And so I just want to point out that that's only a small subset of a much larger number of dog bites that occurs in New Zealand. What we found in our research is that there's nearly 5,000 severe dog bites requiring hospitalisation over that 10 year period, which makes an average of about 496 per year. There was a statistically significant rise in the incidence of dog bites over that period. Um, and if we compare to a similar study that was done 30 years ago, which was done by Marsh Lang and Langley, um, from 1989 to 2001, they also showed the incidence of dog bites rising even then. And we've shown that things have continued to get worse despite the changes in legislation that we've had over that time. What we can see is that there's nearly three times more hospital admissions in the year 2014 than there was in 1989. And interestingly, there was a dip in incidence rates when the dog control laws were introduced in 1996, but a few years on, it unfortunately went back to pre-legislation levels. What we've found in our research is that people are more likely to be admitted to hospital with a dog bite if they are male, so 60% were males. If they are bitten in an area with a high New Zealand deprivation score, so the more deprived areas, um, children under the age of 10 had significantly higher rates and Maori are overrepresented compared to other ethnicities. So there's significant disparities in this area. In terms of age, we found that children under the age of 10 are twice as likely as all other age groups to have these serious dog bites. And we found that they're much more likely to be bitten on the head and the neck, whereas adults are more likely to be bitten on the limbs, and this is consistent with global um, data. We also found that two thirds of those who were admitted uh, re required a general anaesthetic. So in other words, they required a surgical procedure in theater and 15% of them required this more than once. So um, what we find is people often want to know about the research behind the circumstances surrounding a dog bite or what the other risk factors are. For example, um, people would like to know, is the increasing incidence just because there are more dogs? Unfortunately, however, the national dog registration statistics are only available from 2013. And of note, there's only been a slight decrease in the number of registered dogs from 2013 to 2018. And we don't know the number of unregistered dogs. Uh, there are a large number of cohort studies that look into the circumstances surrounding a dog attack. And there is a group in Liverpool who are currently undertaking a systematic review of this literature, but their results are not yet published. 
Um, a few things we do know is that some global data, particularly some research in Canada, suggests that people who are at risk of dog bites are those who are generally vulnerable. So that includes young children, older adults, and those with mental health disorders. Um, we, we know that dog bites occur in both public and private spaces. And in the two New Zealand studies looking at this, which both looked into dog bites requiring hospitalization, one of which was ours, um, they occurred on private property in 30 to 69% of incidents. Although the location of the injury was actually not reported in nearly half the study, half the cases in both studies. And they only looked, of course, at the severe end of the spectrum of bites. There was another study um, in New Zealand uh, of adults um, with dog bites, and that showed that 38% of the attacks occurred in public. 21% in the victim's home, and 43% on other private property. And of those that occurred in a public space, around two thirds were off leads. Um, however, I think this needs further clarification and future research. So dogs are more likely to attack if they're large, um, if they're male, if they're unmuted, if the, if the age of the dog is less than five years, if there's two or more dogs together, which promotes predatory behavior, or if the dog has a history of previous aggression to humans or animals. And bites also more commonly occur when people intervene between two dogs fighting. Um, and the role of the dog breed has been difficult to ascertain just because of difficulties with significant reporting bias in the um, statistics. Dog welfare is probably also a factor. Um, some research shows that dogs are more likely to attack children if they have a lack of early socialization, a lack of yard space, or if they're chained or locked up. And other risk factors include those who allowed their dogs inside for a, portion, um, for a portion of the day, or those who allowed their dog to sleep in a family member's bedroom were more likely to bite a child living in the home. Um, or if the dog was able to leave the premises, i.e. if they don't have a fence. Um, uh, and they're also more likely to occur around the early evening time of day. But however, like I said, hopefully there'll be some more clarification around this with the systematic review of the many studies that are available. Um, so I think where to from here? Um, we've highlighted this as an important public health issue, but actually how to prevent dog bites in New Zealand is something that's going to require some significant changes to what we're doing now. In terms of education, um, the recent focus has been on the behavioral interaction between dogs and children with the assumption that children's education programs will be effective, and certainly there is a systematic review that shows that children education programs improve their short-term behavior around dogs. However, there's no research looking at whether or not the programs actually reduce the incidence of bites. Dog training programs, there are a few small studies that show some potential in this area, so they may be effective, um, but again, that needs further research. Another avenue for change, of course, is legislation, and this needs to be looked at again in the future. In terms of registrations, microchipping, or just general dog control, uh, neutering uh, and the rates of those, the dog access rules, council measures that are put into place in response to an incident, uh, increased reporting of dog bites, or looking at changes in the way that dog bite prevention measures are funded. Um, other possibilities include the use of barriers such as fencing, baby gates or outside um, litter boxes for postal workers. However, this has not been highly promoted and there's no studies that I could find that look at this as an intervention strategy. Um, so just to conclude this talk, I'd just like to highlight that we are currently conducting further research into this, starting with a study looking at the wider incidence of dog attacks in New Zealand in a more recent times from 2014 to 2018 including both hospitalization and ACC data, which catches a wider number of the total dog bites. And we're also hoping to look further into the reasons why the disparities exist to address this. So thank you again um, for this webinar and to Melissa, Laura and the team at Safe Kids for their assistance in furthering um, this as a public health issue. Thank you so much, Dr. Natasha, for sharing some of those really key messages and key statistics. Um, I think it's really important that our community know uh, what's happening. Um, I guess now we'll pass the floor over to Vicky. Um, she will share some of the dog behaviours that we can look into as whānau and community providers, and also some cool practical tips for us to have. Okay, hi Laura. 
Right, so uh, let's get started. Okay, so I've got 15 minutes uh, to talk about uh, a topic that, as Laura said, I'm really passionate about uh, and I could talk about this for a lot longer than 15 minutes. So I'm going to condense it down uh, to some just a few tips on why dogs bite and how you can prevent it, help to prevent, prevent it. Okay, so a bit of information here. Kids are the biggest receiver of dog bites. Many of the children who receive bites actually know the dog. So it's often the family pet or a friend's dog or a relative's dog. So they may be visiting someone's house uh, so they know of the dog. Uh, kids and adults also can get bitten approaching and meeting new dogs when out and about. Having children and a pet dog can be awesome fun, okay, uh, and really rewarding, but parents need to learn what are appropriate ways for their kids to interact with their pet dog, as well as with dogs that they don't know to help prevent bites. Okay, so why do dogs bite? Dogs can bite as a reaction to a stressful situation. It is a dog's way of communicating for that person or, or thing to back off, okay. So they can also bite when they're not feeling well or if they're startled. And they can also knit or bite during play. So that's normally if, if just, you know, with a toy and they accidentally knit because they're trying to grab the, the toy. So, um, okay, dogs can't talk. They can't say, I really don't want you to be so close to me right now or cuddle me. Dogs express their feelings through their body language and their actions. So, which leads me to show you just a few photos of some dogs that are really not comfortable uh, in the moment that that photo was taken. So, if we just have a look at the photo here in the left, uh, we've got the dog's mouth is closed. You can see the whites of his eyes. Uh, we then we move to the right here. We've got another dog, mouth is closed, whites of the eyes are showing. So, he's not comfortable right in that moment. Uh, with with the girl's arms right around him. And then there's a few other photos here which show dogs uh, that really aren't comfortable in that moment. So they'll often sort of back off a little bit, just looking at this photo here and, and they'll lift their paw, ears are back. Okay, then we've got this photo here uh, with him licking his nose. They'll often lick in a situation uh, when they're like a little bit stressed or not comfortable in that moment. They'll often yawn Okay, dogs will yawn just like we do when they're tired, but they also yawn when they're a little bit stressed. Okay, this one here, that moment right there, his tail is right upright, okay. And then over to this little dog here, whites of his eyes are showing, mouth is closed. So just these photos are showing a dog that's tense in that moment uh, and the dog should be left alone, basically. Uh, then just over here, we've got a few more photos. I just wanted to show a, a more relaxed looking dog. Uh, we've got here, mouth is open versus here again, mouth is closed, ears are pinned back. Uh, I would be leaving that dog alone. Uh, and then we go over here, down, down to this dog here. We've got his mouth open, he's a little bit more relaxed in that moment versus whites of his eyes showing, mouth is closed, okay. Um, and then over to these photos, we can see mouth closed, not comfortable versus mouth open. Okay, so, so that can give you a bit of an idea of a relaxed dog uh, versus a tense dog. Okay, so if a dog hasn't experienced life with children as a puppy, it can be harder for them to cope if children come into the picture when they're adults and they can be less tolerant, okay? So that can be a situation of children visiting uh, someone's house and maybe that dog has never, uh, or has limited experience with children. They can, dogs can be, find it really stressful um, when they're not used to them. Kids can be very inappropriate in a dog's world. They don't know how to interact with their pet dog without lots of cuddles and closeness as they would with a teddy bear. This is often why they get bitten. So I see this a lot uh, when I'm visiting families and their houses uh, with their dogs, okay? Kids, all they know, young kids, all they know to do is cuddles, pats, faces up close, all that sort of uh, interaction goes on unless they're shown otherwise. 
Okay, so all dogs have a space bubble. I call it a space bubble. Uh, or we could word it as tolerance. Okay, we and dogs all differ with how much we tolerate. Okay, we don't want to test our pet dog's tolerance level. Okay, so how far we can push that dog until he bites. So I like to teach all kids and parents just blanket rules about what is and isn't appropriate around dogs. Okay, so this photo on the screen, I think we could probably all agree, uh, hopefully that that's really inappropriate. You know, the girl holding the, the dog's lips back, um, you know, the dog may not bite in that situation, but it's a really high risk situation of, of the dog really not having much choice in what's going on there. Okay, so for me, I see that as inappropriate and I wouldn't be letting uh, a child do that. Okay, so rules of respect around the pet dog. This is information that I, I will offer and share with children so leave the dog alone when he's laying down so this is in the house at home with the pet dog or if the child is visiting okay and I'll often say to kids if they really want to interact with the dog uh, sit on the other side of the room or a few meters away and invite the dog over so call them over and if the dog doesn't hop up off where they're laying down and come over, then that's a good sign that they really don't want to interact with the kids. So it's a little bit of respect um, is involved there. And leaving a dog alone when they're eating uh, their dinner or eating a bone or a chew toy, anything like that, um, that includes standing next to the dog uh, and patting them while they're eating any sort of food, chew toy, bone, okay? That's a really high risk situation. And we can see in the photo there with the little girl patting the, the puppy while he's eating. Um, yeah, it's that's high risk stuff, especially, uh, you know, with an adult dog, uh, with, you know, interacting with a dog like that. And, you know, when dogs, and then the photo above, uh, we can see the little boy, he's sort of uh, more than likely kind of uh, crawled over to the dog where the dog is laying down. Uh, if the dog feels uncomfortable in that situation, they really don't want uh, that sort of interaction in that moment. Like I said, they can't say, go away. I don't want to, I don't want you here right now. Okay, they'll use a little bit of their body language. And if they're pushed or ignored, or depending on their tolerance level, uh, they will potentially growl and bite. And where are they gonna get that child, as we can see on those photos, most likely in the face, okay. So hugs and kisses, dogs don't like it. Leave those hugs and kisses for teddies, family members and besties, okay? So when I'm talking about hugs, I'm talking about the, the bear hug, wrapping the arms around the dog. Lots of kids do it. Um, lots of kids will tell me that they do it all the time to their own dog at home uh, and they've never been bitten, okay? But it doesn't mean that the dog's comfortable with it. And uh, putting your face up to your dog's face that's another high risk situation. And we can see in this photo at the bottom, this little girl, she's putting her face up to the dog. I hope we can all see that that dog is really not comfortable with that happening. We can see the whites of his eyes, his mouth is closed. He looks um, pretty intense there and that's a high risk situation. And you know, the dog, depending on his tolerance level, he may not have done anything, okay? But like I said, we don't want to test that. So those sorts of interactions I would be preventing and uh, I wouldn't even be letting my child get into to the dog space like that, okay? Supervision and education. It is the parent's job to provide active supervision and educate the kids about safer interactions with their dog, okay? Kids will often need frequent reminding about what is appropriate around the dog, okay? Uh, so uh, if we can't keep an active eye on the interactions between the dog and the child, then I suggest we have, uh, we put the dog in a safe confined area. Okay, so that's a really good way to manage the dog. Um, and then don't ignore the dog's growl, okay? So if ever, uh, you hear, you know, your dog growl at your child, okay? Uh, don't let that happen. So, so for one thing, don't punish it, okay? We don't wanna punish the dog. We want to, uh, you know, learn that, okay, whatever the child is doing in that situation, the dog's really not liking, okay? So we wanna prevent that from happening again. 
and if need be, see, uh, you know, get a, a qualified dog trainer to help you if it keeps happening. Uh, so continuously teach kids and praise them for doing the right thing. Okay. Uh, have a star chart and reward their good interactions around the family dog so that they can choose to do the right thing more often and it becomes habit. Okay. Uh, I'm often in family environments with the dog and uh, the kids, uh, yeah, are often putting themselves in uh, frequent situations, high risk situations around the dog and it causes, stresses the parents out. And so that's where I'll often implement these ideas, really educate the kid on what is the right thing to do. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, reward them for those, those little baby steps of doing the right thing. Okay. Families that have younger children, like toddlers, crawling babies, kids in this age group can be super inappropriate in a dog's world, okay? Obviously, it's not the kid's fault, but in a dog's world, they can be really inappropriate because they'll often crawl up to the dog as we can see what's happening here in the top photo. Um, and they do very direct approaches to the dog. Sometimes, no matter how much we tell our children how to behave around the dog, we can't always rely on them doing the right thing, okay? So that's where we need to have parents uh, actively supervising them uh, on doing that right thing. Okay, so I often recommend using a dog crate or a cage and uh, maybe indoor fencing as a barrier between the dog and children. So we can see a couple of photos here of those sorts of setups. So I highly recommend that sort of setup so that uh, you can carry on with life and, and know that the children are safe while you walk off and not, are not actively supervising them. Okay, so a few things that kids uh, can do with their dogs other than hugs and cuddles. Okay, uh, so things like drawing a picture or a word out of the dog biscuits. Okay, so that's kind of fun and you can make it as big as you want. Uh, draw a massive smiley face on, I don't know, on the lounge floor or outside out of biscuits. Um, and someone holds the dog while the child is doing that and then they get enjoyment out of watching the dog uh, find and, and eat all their biscuits, obviously without going up to them and patting them while they're doing it. Making puzzle toys, playing fetch, teaching some tricks play, find the treat game in boxes. I could carry on and on. Uh, there's loads of things that kids can do uh, that are safer interactions with dogs. And the dogs love it because it involves food uh, and it's not hands-on. Uh, that's talking about, that those, those are some tips for in the house uh, with dogs and their pet dogs. So now we sort of come to meeting and greeting a new dog when out and about. Okay, so, uh, and how to go about this in a safer way. So ask the owner first, okay? Lots of kids are starting to are, are often know that information at least. Ask the owner first, okay? Uh, next step, don't reach your hand out to the dog to sniff, okay? That's really strong advice that's given out there. Other dogs, don't. we don't need to put our hands into the dog's face to let them sniff it, okay? They can smell you from a mile away. Like they've have got amazing uh, sense of smell. So we don't need to put our hand into their space to, to let them sniff. So what I normally encourage is after you've asked the owner, invite the dog to you to pat them. Okay, so if the owner has said, yeah, sure. Okay, invite the dog to you. Inviting normally means patting your legs or something like that. Invite the dog to you. Often uh, dogs that are already, you know, that love, you know, been uh, interacting and meeting people, they've probably already moved towards the, the person that's asking to pat the dog, okay? But invite the dog to you, okay? And I'll suggest to the kids, pat from the dog's collar to the tail. That's generally a, a pretty safe place to be able to pat a dog. No hugs, okay? Danger zone if you do that. Uh, no looming over the dog. Uh, no putting your face, close up to the dog's face, really, really dangerous, okay? And be calm around the dog. So there's some uh, simple tips on, on meeting and greeting a new dog. And then lastly, uh, be a tree. Okay, so this is talking about there might be a situation where a child's at a park and a dog is out uh, being walked by their owner. 
okay? So sometimes a dog may come running up to, to the child. Some children are, are, are worried in that situation. If they're worried, I suggest uh, that they be nice and still like a tree, okay? In their roots down to the ground, okay? And because of course, if they are worried and if they do run, often the dog will chase. Um, for the most part, most dogs that go trotting up to a child or a person at the park, they're just being nosy, okay? That's the most common scenario and that's the, that's the scenario that I'm talking about, okay? So they're being nosy. However, if you're, if you're uncomfortable, be still, don't run, don't squeal, okay? You're either gonna excite the dog um, or worry the dog. So dogs get bored with trees, okay? They may have a quick sniff, then they're gonna just wander on off if you're nice and still. Um, and that can also help uh, at home with an exuberant dog or for a child visiting a friend's house and they've got a dog that loves chasing them around. And if they stop and be still like a tree, often the dog loses interest quite quickly. So they, that's my 15 minutes worth of tips. Uh, I hope you found that helpful. Thanks, Laura. Thank you so much for that, Vicky, and you know, sharing some of the dog's body language for us to understand and recognize it when we see it happening in our pets. Um, so I guess we'll move into the next section, which is our treat section, which is a question. I can see uh, some have already come up um, and I will just direct them and feel free to chip in if you have more to add on. Um, I guess so the first question is, how do you introduce a baby to your dogs and keep them safe around your family pets, even if um, they are no threat? to you, but you still want to keep both pet and child safe. So I'll direct that to you, Vicky, if you want to start that. Yeah, okay. okay, that's a nice question. Okay, well, I often, uh, normally I'd suggest is it'd be quite a nice idea for while, before even the baby comes, it would be quite good for the dog to get a little bit used to, you know, the different things that a baby might involve, uh, you know, the, 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 different things that come into the house, you know, the pram, all sorts of things. But once the baby is there, uh, often maybe if, you, if the parent is sitting down with the baby and encouraging the dog over, maybe have someone else there and, and maybe giving the dog some treats while they, you know, the baby is in the mother's arms, yeah. Um, I'll, and also utilizing the barriers, like I mentioned in my slideshow. So when it comes to little kids, uh, having a barrier or a playpen or something in the lounge so the dog can still be there, can still get used to the sounds and the noises that the baby makes. Um, you can still then put the baby on the floor, uh, but the dog is on the other side of the barrier and, and can get used to it very gradually like that. So that's, I hope that helps. One of the paediatricians has pointed out to me as I've been um, doing some of this research that um, supervision around children is obviously age dependent and that parents don't always interestingly um, understand exactly how to supervise different children of different ages. And so I was interested in what Vicky was saying about um, supervising children um, and particularly in the young ones that, that it's not possible really to always supervise them and that the provision of baby gates and um, barriers um, as being important. Um, and so I just yeah like to agree with that, that. I think that particularly for the younger children, that that's going to be probably more important than just simply supervising. Mm. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Natasha and, and Vicky. Um, so our next question um, is, why do you think some communities are more at risk than others? Um, if I could pass that over to you, Dr. Natasha, if that's come up in any of your research that you've been looking at. at. There are the disparities in um, between different socioeconomic areas um, and within ethnicity as well. And we don't know yet if those are related. Um, that's something that we need to look into further. Um, at this stage, we don't really know um, the reasons why. Um, but we need to look at some of the structural problems that are, um, that are contributing to it. Um, and that's something that we are hoping to do further research on. Um, potential differences that um, we have come up with so far uh, include the uh, perhaps differences in the proportion of dog ownership, uh, differences in the availability and method of funding um, for dog control or in the allocation of those resources. Um, there may be a difference in proportion of certain breeds, although there is a worldwide trend away from breed-specific legislation. 
Um, there may be differences in um, access to dog registration or uh, in uh, dog owner or dog training courses or access to children's um, education courses like Vicky provides. Uh, there may be a difference in um, the dog access legislation. So, uh, for example, in the proportion of the dog off-lead areas for recreational spaces. Uh, fencing of private property, um, decisions around neutering, uh, reasons for dog ownership, acceptability of the current dog owner uh, control strategies. Um, there might be differences in the provision of dog care, dog barriers that like we're talking about, um, or supervision of children and other vulnerable people. So those are the sorts of things that we're trying to look into. Awesome, thank you. Um, the next question is, I know you both already touched on it, um, why are children more likely to be bitten in the head and the neck areas? Um, Dr Natasha, we'll go to you and then go through to Vicky. We haven't looked specifically at um, why um, those injuries are more likely to occur on the head and the neck, but um, our assumption is that it's just because of the children's height. Um, because there's uh, clearly once they get over the age of 10, that incidence reduces quite significantly. And again, once they're an adult. So we assume it's mostly because of height. But as Vicky has also pointed out, that the way that children interact with dogs may also be um, uh, uh, contributing to that too. Yeah, Vicky, do you have anything to add on to that? Um, pretty much just what Natasha said. Yeah, kids, uh, the height and yep, yeah, they're often kissing, cuddling, face up close. I see it all, I see it a lot just in, in family households. So that's, yeah, pretty much why I would guess, assume that's where they're gonna get bitten. Awesome, okay. And our final one is, if your dog is a naturally always folded back, um, and seal, aka a stuffy, how can you tell that they are uncomfortable? Um, over to you, Vicky. Um, well, you'd look at the context. So, uh, you know, there's other things that might do, you know, like I said, the mouth will close, uh, often will close. You'll often see the whites of their eyes. So you'll get to know your own dog. All dogs have sort of different, you know, facial features. So you'll get to know your own dog uh, when they're relaxed and happy, uh, even if the ears are back a lot. Uh, you'll get to get to know that. And then you look at the context or what's happening in that moment. And that's where often I think, well, you know, if you're unsure and it's an, and you've got a child, uh, then just maybe, you know, stop the interaction or, yeah, um, redirect the dog or the child on something else if you're unsure how that dog is feeling. Uh, again, thank you so much for, to both of you um, for giving up your time to be with us and also for sharing your knowledge and expertise with our community that, um, that I'm sure they really appreciate just as so much as we do. 